Diamonds are forever It's the trout. You just got through seeing snippets from that great video, The Ultimate James Bond Medley. Did you know there was 25 James Bond movies made? And for each James Bond movie, there was a brand new theme song. That's a lot of movies. That's a lot of songs. Well, David Stanley, recording engineer extraordinaire and producer, decided it would be a great idea to put all 25 songs together in one single video. He located 60 musicians around the UK area to perform and do each one of these songs. Not only did he record it as an engineer, he videoed it himself, but he also wrote the score. That's a lot of work and he came out with a great, great project. And if you want to know how it was made, stay tuned to see it next on KT and the Trout. I'm KT. And I'm the Trout, and welcome to KT and the Trout episode. Oh, this Where are we is at luck- now? We, is this like lucky episode 13? Oh, my goodness. Lucky number 13. Lucky number 13. We got someone awesome on today, too. I'm excited uh, about this one. We're not going to need to spend much time talking about us because you know all about us anyway. I just want to get to our guest today because we have a Boy. wonderful guest. Uh, but before I forget, remember push the like, subscribe button that's going to appear now. Ding. Ding. And, uh, Make sure you tell your friends about it. And we're on YouTube. We're on podcasts everywhere. And the everything to find us is ktandthetrout.com. That's all you got to do is go to KT and the Trout. Enough about that. Let's get to our guest. So as most people in the, in the world, they all know the name Bond, James Bond. Mm. And uh, I spent a lot of time watching YouTube videos. And the we're one talking about the, the um, Heineken Bond or the... <laughs> martini bond <laughs> i've seen them all and uh as i watch a lot of videos to obviously looking for great guests for us to have on the show but also i'm a musician so i look for look, you know, music the algorithm found me a video that caught my eye called the ultimate james bond whatever it was called it was and i just said oh okay I'll look at it and it was a list of all 25 and i didn't know first of all, i didn't know there's that many james bond movies 
So this studio over in England, and the engineer that we're going to introduce right now, the producer, decided, hey, I got a great idea. Let's put all 25 James Bond songs together in one YouTube video. And I thought, ah, listen to it. And from the very beginning, with the harpist playing, I went, okay, this is good from the very beginning. And it just got better and better. And it, and when I watched it, uh, I think it's been up for about three or four months now. If I'm not correct me if I'm wrong, it had about ten thousand views. Now it's pushing three hundred thousand. And it, I think it's just to talk about it. Uh, it's just, and so I reached out to Dave Stanley, who's going to be here right now, our guest, the engineer and producer of this wonderful piece of work and dave was kind enough to come on so all the way it's our first international yeah podcast well and i think everybody should know too this isn't taking the songs and putting them together this is i mean you know from start to finish yeah i mean it's it's an incredible piece so first off dave thank you for coming today we really appreciate it no thanks and for having me guys welcome to our wonderful little show uh Katie and I decided we didn't have enough to do in our life. We wanted to do podcasts and YouTube. And I continue to find guests that should be fun. We have, in fact, I just got the other one. Another UK performer is coming on in next month. She's nice. on. So she's coming on. London. So let's let's start at the beginning and I'm going to get to your project. In a, but let's let's talk about you real quick. So are you from the area that you live in now? Are you from Nottingham or are you from somewhere else? Um, kind of. I grew up about an hour um, north of Nottingham. So I kind of knew the area, but um, it's only the past eight or nine years that I've actually um, been living and working in, in this city. Mm. And, and so you grew up there and around there. And then so you come back to the city. And how many people live in Nottingham? I didn't look that up. Um, I mean, in UK terms, it's a kind of like medium sized city. It kind of okay. feels like a really, um, like a really big town. Um, but, uh, you know, it's kind of got a nice kind of, it's like a city with a community feel, you know, that kind of, that yeah. kind of size. And, and so you decided several years ago that did you want to pursue being an engineer or being, are you a musician yourself or you just wanted to get into the recording industry? Yeah, it was um, it was one of those things where, like, when I was a kid, um, I had like an instrument placed in front of me and said, "You're going to play an instrument." I said, like, "Okay, I'll yeah. play an instrument." Um, and I went through the kind of the usual kind of school journey of learning all that. Um, and one thing that I figured out real quick was that I just really hated performing in front of people. Um, I hated being in the spotlight. I hated practicing and like not practicing to get better, but practicing and people hearing how bad it was right. until it was better. I hate it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I kind of stuck with it. So I grew up learning piano and violin. Um, but when I realized, like getting towards um, like the end of school, that there was this other side of things where you could do all this technical behind the scenes stuff. Um, and then realizing everything that I liked about music was created by these guys who were producers and engineers and all that stuff. When I realized that was something I could do and it meant hanging out like behind the scenes rather than yeah. on stage in front of people. Yeah. Like I kind of threw the instruments aside and went straight onto it really. That's um, it, yeah. And I kind of hadn't gone back since. I mean, embarrassingly, even though like at my best, I was pretty decent at playing piano and violin. Now, like even though like I know how to play them to physically actually play them and make it sound good is like, it's embarrassingly like not good. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? I think that helps you though in your job because you understand musicians being around yeah, musicians yeah, yeah. all the time, and we don't even understand ourselves. So, and and <laughs> here's here's the interesting thing about it. Caleb's the lead singer. I'm a lead guitar player. So you know how we like crowds <laughs> fighting. Well, yeah, exactly. going to get the spot. I was going to get the spotlight. So, but, I mean, but then then I was you just in that studio too. There's something to be said about that studio. It's yeah, a, he's done a lot a of different, studio work. Uh, it's a different kind of drug, man. It's yeah. 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 I love the studio. So how old were you when you decided I'm going to leave the UK and come to LA and just say, Hey, I'm going to come out here and do my thing. How did that all come about though? Um, I mean, I don't know how much you guys know about how our education system works, but you kind of have, um, like three levels where it separates. So what we call high school finishes at around 16. And then after that, we have what we call college, which, um, used to be optional, it's kind of mandatory now, but you used to have two years of college, which is kind of like somewhere between 
um, a bachelor's degree and a high school diploma. Um, and then after that is when you go on to the university level stuff. Um, and it was when I was doing the college years, um, which is kind of like just, it's like pigeonholing what you think you want to do and kind of honing them rather than doing everything. Um, that's when I was really looking at like, you know, what do I do next to get into this industry, how to get this career. And like all the guys who dealt with careers at school, they were just like, I don't know, like, you know, <laughs> go off to a, um, you know, a university somewhere. And it's kind of like the default thing where everyone's like, okay, we finished college now, let's all go to university. And you just kind of do that, whether you know what you're going to do next or not, you just do that and then see what happens. Um, and when I was looking at all the different places um, that offer courses, like in the kind of ballpark yeah. of what I want to do, it all kind of, the paper sounded like kind of impressive and you'd have, you know, a, a degree from a prestigious university at the end of it or something. Um, but none of it kind of really made sense. It all felt like, you know, why would I go to some humdrum city in the corner of the UK to learn how to be a music producer or an engineer when everyone who's really great at being a producer engineer haven't learned it through some teachers who are teaching you because right. they have given up on industry or whatever reason they're there, you know, it all felt a little bit, um, it just didn't make sense. Um, so I kind of, I just kept kind of Googling, um, really just try and figure it out. And I just came across this school in, uh, LA. Um, and it was just called the uh, Los Angeles recording school. I was like, well, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. that makes That's sense, true. right? Um, yeah. It's a recording school and it's in Los Angeles, which is where all the stuff is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll go do that. Um, I know a lot of the accredited colleges and stuff when they do music, it's really more music theory based, right? Let's, you know. Sort of. It's kind of weird. There were two versions. There was the arts bachelors and the science bachelors. Yeah. And the arts were yeah. kind of a little bit more geared towards, I don't know, being creative and performing, but they were also still... They were more based around whether you're a good performer and just filling up that syllabus with stuff which made it feel like a degree. Mm. It only felt like such a small amount, which was learning what I needed to do to be, you know, an engineer. And then the science was like the complete other end of the spectrum where they were just teaching all this stuff about physics and electronics and computers and stuff, mm. which again is kind of not useful. Um, I mean, it kind of is, but not really practically. It was kind of all the stuff. You know, like when you leave school and you think, well, why did I learn Pythagoras and all that kind of yeah. thing? <laughs> and you have, yeah. Obviously, there's a few yeah. things that you always like cling on yeah. to. And then, yeah. you know, you end up doing yeah. some DIY and you're like, oh, yeah, sure. uh, you know, I do yeah, need yeah, Pythagoras. Yeah. Um, Makes sense. It was like so much of that information just was just irrelevant just to make up a degree. Um, whereas when I was looking at what was on the curriculum and the syllabus at um, the early recording school, it was just like, you know, week one. Like you're learning consoles, week two, you're learning this, week yep. three, it was just uh, like yep. everything. Um, and the tests that they gave you were just to make sure that you actually were taking it in. They weren't just there just to tick a box and give you a certificate, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'll say that they do offer degrees now. Um, when I was there, they didn't, but, you know. So were you, I noticed I was looking at uh, your information on your website and all that and doing some little history on you, but were you exposed to some A clients, I mean, A-listers then? I mean, yeah. Studio, um, and did they have their own studio, or did you go to the studio there locally? When, no. So they did. Um, they did have their own studios, and it was that was just for like the students and um, the staff to kind of work in and stuff. Um, and they did bring a few people in that were kind of like private clients of the staff that you could help out on. But um, I guess the first exposure I had really to the industry was the fact that you don't get anywhere unless you start working at other studios, interning, and doing all that kind of, yeah. you know. The rookie yeah. stuff and working your way up um and you couldn't actually pass this course unless you had at least a minimum amount of hours in turn um, hours yeah 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 um so i just went like full steam with that and i was just working every night or every day whenever i was free just in other studios um and i just kept doing that until uh until you know uncle sam kicked me out basically yeah yeah i did <laughs> see that <laughs> or i left before he kicked me out um should i say um yeah yeah so i was working um i worked at westlake studios um for some time did some work with um a vocal coach who ran a studio james lugo who's a super cool guy 
um, there were some time at Chalice as well. Um, and it was just kind of just working everywhere I could really just to get as much experience as I could. Experience, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I took somewhat the same approach, and I uh, I actually attended the Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences in Phoenix, Arizona. That probably could have been one that popped up on your up on the. the I mean, it sounds swanky. Yeah, it, yeah, it was pretty <laughs> swanky. And afterwards, you got kind of like an associates in applied science is what, right. what the kind of degree you got. But it was the same thing. It was like you know, hands on, you know, learning the old consoles and and doing the yeah. internship thing. So yeah, 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 good stuff. So then you brought it back home. And you had to find a place to work. So here you know have this knowledge. So how did it? Ha you got back to the UK, and then what, what happened after that? Well, like I said, I kind of came back to the UK finally um, after the, the tricky thing was like this kind of work is almost always some kind of freelance thing. You know, you never have a salary, which means you getting a visa to stay in the states with that kind of job is yeah. like pretty much yeah. impossible. Um, yeah. Which is why I eventually had to kind of like leave it before I kind of pushed it. Um, so yeah, and that's when I settled to come back to the UK. Um, but what I didn't realize was that the industries were so disconnected in the UK and the US. I thought, you know, I've got all this experience, I've got these contacts, all these people that are saying, you know, this guy is doing great things, you know, mm -hmm. um, give him a job kind of thing. And everyone in the UK was just like, we don't care. What? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like they, they were like, oh, which, so which uh, university did you go to? I was like, oh, well, I didn't. I was like, okay, well, and it was literally that kind of just Jeez. was the biggest yeah. roadblock um and no matter what i did i couldn't find a way in um you know no matter who i knew and i kind of realized that there's a lot more kind of um it's been more of like a closed circuit over here everyone wants yeah. to kind of help their friend out um yeah yeah once you're in there you can kind of like you've got it easy and you can just kind of like ride along a little bit um but I've never like been one for taking it easy. I'd rather just be like worked hard and like tested and yeah. you know, head strong. Which yeah, yeah. Again, LA is great because everyone's waiting for you to trip up, so everyone's working like extra hard and you know yeah. doing their dog eat dog stuff. So yeah, I was um, figuring a way out, and when I was looking at different cities and where I had a music scene and stuff that was interesting happening, um, I kind of only looked at Nottingham kind of casually, just because I knew of it from you know living that far away. But one thing I did notice is that there wasn't anywhere to work at. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay. Um, well, that's interesting. So I decided to try and build a studio that was the kind of place that I wanted to work at. Um, so I didn't build it because I was like, oh, hey, I'm a big shot. I, I own a studio because that's what every guy who just leaves college is. I wanted to build a place that mm. would attract the kind of clients that I could learn from and work with other engineers and had a staff. So it was kind of, you know, a full studio. I wanted to get better at what I did. Um, so that's what I did, um, basically. Um, and I've been spending the past awesome. eight years building that, really. All right. So I saw the picture. What was the building that you're in, the recording studio? What was it before that? Um, I mean, I don't know what it was originally, but I think it's probably had a similar use the whole time. I think it's about 100 years old. It's not um, crazy old. Um, but it was an empty car garage. Um, I said it was a girl. I looked like a garage to me. Looked like well, what was like when we first? It was perfect because it was um, not on the market yet. I think there'd been some previous issues with the the previous tenant, um, but it was an empty shell, so there was nothing inside, which is great. Right. Because um, so we could build all the, the walls inside. But what was in the middle was one of these big old car inspection pits. It was like deep in the yeah. ground. Yeah. And yeah. I just remember the forklift truck that we had bringing all the materials decided it would be a good idea to drive over that. And the whole truck <laughs> went down this inspection <laughs> pit and destroyed it. Was, you know, it like, happened in slow motion. Like me and my partner were just watching all of our materials get destroyed as this driver just thought he could oh. drive down this pit. It was a, uh, so in the end we, uh, we covered that up. Um, just, we're wondering whether to use it as like a you know small little echo chamber or something, but uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, and we just covered it up. And Studio A's control room was built on top of that. I can That's see the crazy. ad now. We have the pit. Come and record in the pit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like going to the bathroom. But did I did I see something about? I know it was around 2013 or something. You had like for someone help or you? Well, over here they're called grants, but you had somebody kind of financially help put the build the. The recording studio or kind of help you yeah, no um like there's been a few small bits of help like since COVID and stuff um 
but the initial um, build of the whole studios, um, we just did off our own backs. We just, oh wow, you know, okay, um, you know, got the funding together between ourselves to sort of personal money and um, built it then. So now, so um, awesome, man. <clears throat> and then you had to start getting people to come in and record, which. Uh, there's a lot of people that want to do that, but then when you tell them how much it is, they go, eh, I don't know how much, you know? Well, during, especially that. during these times, you know what I mean, with a new studio, I noticed Nottingham's probably around a 340,000 person population, which is not, that's not shabby, especially off. there's nothing available there. Um, yeah. I think the first battle was just getting it done, man, right? You know, that's- Yeah, it was like six months of building. So, yeah. which, which isn't too bad, really, considering it yeah. was kind of just like four of us wandering around following a professional trying to, you know, do it as efficiently, but cheaply as well, you know, Yeah. Um, but without cutting as corners. As far as the design of the studio, I mean, was that something that you pretty much, as far as acoustics and how to, you know, do the, the walls and stuff, was that something that you, did they teach that part of it where you were at the LA recording? Yeah, show? sort of, like, you knew the theory of it, you knew what worked and what didn't work, yep. you knew that, yep. you know, end of the day, no matter what materials you use, if you're in a tiny space, it's never going to be soundproof. Sure. Um, right. So we kind of had to work around like the confines of what the building was. Um, so yeah, like, we had an architect kind of put my like verbalizations into practicality saying like, this needs to do this, this can't be there, this has to be there. Gotcha. Um, you know, the windows have to be built like this, the doors have to fit like that. Um, and the way we did it in the end was even though we knew we wouldn't be able to get it to be fully soundproof without making it just one, you know, self-contained room, because we needed more than one room, we kind of arranged it so the live rooms were kind of in between different rooms, so you could mm. kind of use them. If you knew something was going on in one room that might interfere with the other, there's always another room in between, so there's this sure. kind of, um, there's a way of working it. That makes sense, yeah, like a speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and um, studio I recorded back in '94 was in on a used to be a chicken ranch, and the guy was signed with Columbia Records, and he was he was up in Iowa and the Midwest and the United States, and and uh, there's no windows in it, and I said why are there no windows? He said because you don't want to you don't care what time it is, so if you went you, oh, yeah. you didn't know whether it's noon or you know and it was it was great because oh, you couldn't the whole, it was, the there was no Vegas distracting there's no yeah it was like no distraction. Yeah, well, compared to like in a casino, you want like time to fly by, and you just want to yeah. be completely lost. So no clocks and no windows. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I, I'm just, I want to tell you this. First off, congratulations on that project. I mean, oh, that, that project is. I, I don't know, you know, I, I so there. I guess my question is this: So you're sitting around going, "Hey, I got an idea. Let's get 25 people to do 25 different James Bonds." So, I mean, where did who came up? Was that your idea to come up with this and try to? Yeah, do it? like it. It was kind of a weird one. Like what it ended up being, and the reason for it being kind of changed and evolved as we did it. But so what, what I used to do. Um, as often as I had the time was just to kind of engage with the community um, in the city was we I used to kind of get musicians that either I hadn't worked with in a certain way or hadn't visited the studios before and I'd try and create a project that everyone could collaborate on that was just for like nothing more than fun right um, and I did a couple of those um, and I had a, we used to do them when we first opened the studios um, but we hadn't done any, any in ages and we did a couple and during the first, um, I think it was the winter lockdown that we had during COVID, um, I tried to get a small one together and just, it was four musicians that um, I'd worked with a little bit before that I knew were super talented. Um, and I thought, right, let's get these together and we'll do that. And what I didn't realize was how much they'd appreciate being dragged out of their homes and into the studio oh, yeah. to do something. And they were kind of, everyone was like a little bit anxious about it because we're trying to follow guidelines and stuff. And obviously there's going to be a video, so it needs to visually be following guidelines too. <laughs> um, but once we'd finished that session, even though everyone was kind of like, you know, we hadn't practiced this song and no one was feeling confident because they hadn't gigged in months and months. Um, everyone was just like, everyone was like kind of glowing with excitement that they'd just done this thing. They didn't care if anyone heard it. They were just like so appreciative to be there. Yeah. And that's what made me think, well, I, I need to kind of do this again with something a little bit bigger and get more musicians involved. And so when I planted this seed, um, 
months and months ago about oh it'll be it'd be really cool if you like you could do a medley of all the James Bonds and I was like no 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 there's like there's loads of them like I, I, I haven't got the time to do all of this you know yeah, right. um, I was from a guy who was a musician but didn't know how much time it takes to do something properly in the studio um, so I was just like no no that's not going to happen um, but the seed has already been planted obviously so it was obviously growing and sprouting somewhat um, so after I did this. Um, a uh, smaller scale video, which was just one song and four musicians just doing a cover of, you know, Teardrops, Womack and Womack. Um, they just did a fun thing of that. I started to kind of think, like, oh, could I actually get this done? And I was like, well, like, musicians aren't doing anything right now. They're all at home having the worst time because the industry's, you know, looks yeah, like yeah. it's going to collapse and they don't know when they're going to gig again. And yep. um, so surely it's going to be easy. Um, and I started kind of planning it out. And uh, just went and started the process of trying to figure out how to create, you know, something that would be worth watching. Mm. So my, awesome. my thing about it is, so when I watched it, um, did, was there, did you actually try to find people that sounded somewhat similar to the original people that re record? I mean, there, there's some, there's a lot of similarities. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, watching, you know, the, especially like that Goldfinger one, and there's some mm. of them iconic. And I thought, oh, she sounds a little bit like Shirley Bassey, you know. And I mean, it was yeah, that, yeah. was that a was that something you went to try to find when you hired got these people to come in and do it? Um, like yes and no. Um, with this, because the reason it started was purely to try and get all these musicians literally out their house. That's cool. You know, yeah. I was kind of I didn't have. I wasn't putting too much control on the projects that I've done before like this, whereas be before I was trying to make sure that everyone sung things in a certain way and make this person do this, this, I kind of just said, look, yeah. I've got this medley. This is the section of the song I want to use. Like, take it and make it your own. Do what you want. Whatever makes you enoy it and, you know, just let me know if you need to change the key because I need to make it fit with the melody, all that kind of stuff, but do what you want. And I knew that certain songs and musicians that I knew, they would like pair really well just because of the kind of music that they did. Mm -hmm. um, but others, I knew that they, no matter what they did, they would just put their own spin on it. So I kind of, I just kind of left it up to the gods really. Um, and it just happened to just work out where some of them kind of sound similar. Like the Shirley Bassey one, like the, the woman who sings that, she just has this really cool jazzy voice. Um, mm -hmm. So she's kind of able to put that kind of flair in it. So even though, you can't compare it to Shirley Bassey because that's like a, a different kind different, of thing. Yeah, yeah. You kind of it feels like it. You know, it, it meshes with that kind of style pretty well. So, did you focus on like, um, like what what it sounded like and try to somewhat mimic the the same effects and tones and and as, as best as you could on all of them? Um, like, you know, again, no, you know, not really. Just because I knew that. So this, I knew that this was going to be a huge project. Um, but I knew if I tried to put the detail in where I tried to capture it in the same way the originals were done, that yeah. too much scrutiny. That that. If I say that I've done this the yeah. same way as they've done, the scrutiny would be insane. So sure. I tried to be, um, like, I guess, respectful and faithful. And my kind of, my style of working is kind of organic and fairly, fairly old school anyway. So yeah. um, I did adapt for each song in a slightly different way. Um, That's great. Yeah, that's great. Put your so, own little stamp on it. For let, sure. let me go. Yeah. Let me go to the logistics side of it. How did you get clearance on all these songs? I mean, did you? Well, as somebody do. I mean, do, I when I saw it, I kept thinking, "Well, hey, God, it's great to get twenty five people to do something." But then I'm thinking about all these different copyrights and clearance to do all that stuff. So how did that? How did that? This is the reason why it's on YouTube. They, I just made sure it was nothing but a cover on YouTube that's covered by the blanket license. So it's okay, not yeah. going on Spotify or anywhere like that where you need to get clearance for a, um, yeah, yeah. Or a mechanical or anything like that. Um, so yeah, it's so, so it's it, YouTube only. When you so only. How, when did you start the project? When did you originally start recording? Well, I started putting the um, the kind of skeleton of the medley together probably around February, maybe um, okay. when uh, when things were still pretty quiet and had more time on my hands um, and that was essentially just kind of finding out what order I wanted the songs to go and which snippets of each song um, and then I was kind of just trying to put names to each song trying to make sure I had a, someone for each song and then 
um, what I needed to make all of it work as a whole. Um, so I took quite a bit of time um, just trying to get anyone to commit to anything during you know the past few months has been really difficult um, yeah. for a variety of reasons. Um, and I didn't want to do something and realize I'll be halfway through and then it'll be, you know, I'll be stuck. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and initially it, it went really quickly. Once I started getting the different bands and musicians in, um, the first chunk of it went super quick. Um, and then it was just kind of, it got a little bit kind of longer and harder as the world started reopening again. People yeah. started becoming more hesitant about doing it. And some people kind of thought, oh, well, you know, this isn't my priority now. So it was mm. kind of even harder to convince people to come in. Um, and I think I ended up finishing it probably like two or three weeks before I put it out on YouTube. I was just like, as soon as I finished that, yeah, just throw it out there before everyone forgets about COVID because this is why it was on. <laughs> um, so I think it was, um, was it August or something, end of August that I put it out? Yeah, I think so. I think that's yeah. originally the August. Yeah. Did you, did you ever think that was going to be this successful? Um, did it ever yeah. cross your mind? There was a thing in the back of my head where I thought, with it being, so there were 60 people, 60 musicians involved in this in the end, right? Jeez. Wow. Um, because there's the orchestra sections and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. And I figured, at the very least, all these people are going to be really happy that they've created this thing. So they'll share it to their friends, maybe a couple of family members. So if there's 60 people, at least 120 people will like it, right? <laughs> Um, yeah. that but, sounds like what we do. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I thought, in terms of like Facebook and Instagram and stuff, I thought, yeah, that that'll be fine. And then everyone's happy. Um, funnily enough, like it didn't actually get that much love locally. Like everyone initially were just like, yeah, yeah, this is fun. And then it just like disappeared, and everyone forgot about it. Um, and I'm sure some of the people involved haven't even watched it yet, for whatever reason. Um, interesting. So. I put it on YouTube just to make sure it was on there, just so people could find it. Um, and I just completely forgot about it. Um, and it was only maybe when you saw it was on 10,000, that was. Yeah, it, it was like, um, yeah, 10,000 or something like the view. I think it had been on like two or 300 for over a month before then, because I just left it up wow. there and no one, no one was sharing wow. it. And then yeah. maybe two or three weeks after the movie came out, um, that's probably when it started to pick up a bit more steam. Yeah. Yeah. Well, people yeah. start researching James Bond and all yeah. kinds of stuff, you know what I mean? And so with that said, are you, uh, <clears throat> with the success of this one, what's the, what's the next route? What, what's the next one you're going to do? <laughs> well, I mean, so I said the kind of the project evolved a little bit. Um, so when I was close to finishing it, um, while I was recording the orchestral parts, um, I actually really, came to discover that my studios was be forcibly being demolished by the landowner. What? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In a kind of interesting way. Um, so <laughs> yeah, rather than it being just a thing for lockdown for me, it was like, okay, well, I need to make sure this is good. Cause it might be kind of like the final thing I do in this building. Um, Lord, which it kind of has. So, um, That's literally sad. this is why I'm from my home office now. Yeah. So literally next week, um, after then the, the bulldozers are moving in. Uh, um, so in terms of the next project, it's not going to be from yeah, those videos, yeah, it's just going to yeah. be, you know, whatever I'm rolling on to. Well, I think the thing is, so the name, Raffle, because I saw it, I said it's, well, uh, what is it called? Al Alchemistic Records or something like that? Yeah, yeah, so that's the production label that I, I work yeah. with. Yeah. And then I go, well, I know what ROFL is in, <laughs> in terms, and I thought, that can't be what he's, and then it said, Rhymes with waffle. So, <laughs> what is the R O F L raffle studio? The name. It's yeah. like it's just a terrible name that like just it stuck and didn't go away. And the funny thing is, is that it's, a, it's a, obviously it's an awful name because you have to explain it to everyone. But it worked because because no one knew what it was when they asked about it. They always remembered it, and it's the one music facility in the area that doesn't have some generic name like sound this or audio yeah, this yeah, is just kind yeah, of like yeah. so in terms of like marketing even though it's a little bit confusing um it's definitely a memorable name um i think that's, um, that's being a marketing guy myself i think that's what you want to do because it's like people yeah. go oh, it's, uh what is it called uh yeah. it's like uh roll on the floor laughing no that's not it it's you know and and so yeah, yeah, yeah. i i but the thing about it is um 
this, the musicians that are on it. Now, it's kind of interesting because then I'm, well, maybe not everybody does this. I start looking into them because you hear them. Mm, yeah. You start looking at them and going, okay, they must have some other stuff out. And some of them didn't have a lot of, you know, didn't have a lot of music out on YouTube. Yeah, so, well, I mean, one girl, um, Ella Chambers, who did the uh, For Your Eyes Only song. Oh, yeah. Um, it was, I just found her on Instagram, and it was the first time she'd ever set a foot into a studio recording her anything wow. and she was you know she was so quiet and nervous while she was there and she was panicking because she wasn't sure if the, she knew you know how to play it properly or sing it properly mm. um and obviously what she's come out with is you know a beautiful different take on the song um whereas other people they you know they're kind of you know they've been doing it a while and kind of know the ropes and it was you know easy for them well it's very mm -hmm. eclectic i think that's what makes it work too because you, you, you know some of these people that are performing probably don't play that music. I mean, I'm sure a lot of them don't play James Bond music when yeah. they're out gigging. So it's like, you know, and, then I, and and some of the voices are just, in, they're very great. I mean, just incredible yeah. voices. And I, I applaud you. Of course, this is what you do for a living. But the production value is just, I mean, we all know how much better it sounds in the studio versus on YouTube. But when yeah, it sounds yeah. good on YouTube, you know it really had to sound great in the studio. Yeah. And so the so the string and the and the horns, all that, were those people that you knew and you brought them in? Because I noticed that the more I watched it, the first time I watched through, I didn't pick it up on. It, but then you then you obviously had to overdub a lot of parts. But then yeah. the violins are coming in, and then oh look, they're playing another segment. Yeah. yeah. Did, um, did, uh, when they came in, did they do all theirs at one time? The, the... Well, that was it. So um, while we're doing most of this, there's pretty strict um, lockdown stuff going on. So even the one, uh, the bands, most of those had to come in uh, one by one to record their parts. There's only a few that happened to be living together, so they were able to come in together. Um, so all the string parts, um, they had to be done one at a time, just because it this point no one was able to meet in enclosed spaces together mm -hmm. um but i wanted to make sure i would still record it the same way that i would have done if it was the full orchestra so um i had each player in the same position each time so they weren't kind of just sat in the middle of a booth or anything um you know first violins were over on this side cellos were over this side oh, just like and when they double it up they were sat behind them as if they were the extra player Right. So, um, so there was probably there was eight string parts in total. So you know, small orchestra, but they were all sat as if there was eight people playing. So the acoustics gotcha. exactly yeah. what they would have been. Um, obviously, not quite the same, um, but that's what gives it that kind of authentic, lush, mm -hmm. not forced feel about it. Mm -hmm. Problem with that, obviously, is that it means that whereas I might have just had two channels recording a string section yeah. and I had like 16 doing it. So it made the project a little bit more, more cumbersome than I would have liked. Well, and then the same well, way with the horn <laughs> section, you brought yeah, it yeah. in and you know, it's one of those things you watch the first time and I didn't catch it. And then I started, Oh, wait a minute. They're on there three times. <laughs> same yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, so, I knew quite a lot of string players and for some reason I found it harder to get hold of horn players. <laughs> Um, and because I've got the strings background as well, it was super easy for me to write the string parts down. Whereas the horns, I was kind of having to like think back to my theory to make sure I got it right, and then have discussions with them to change things just to make it work. Um, and I was literally conducting them through the control room window, saying, "Oh, you know, this is meant to be a, sl a slide part and all that kind of stuff." Um, so your your music background obviously helped you then when you put it together. Yeah. So all the songs before they were recorded, um, I scored them all out exactly how oh, I wanted wow. to So I, I scored all That's the strings crazy, and then all the horns yeah. and then sent that to the, the band and said, right, this is what's going to be there, strings and horns. Like, do what you want around that. Um, yeah, I'm more impressed. That was like the glue. That was the glue. <laughs> yeah. will work. Well, too, and I mean, you know, you know, ultimately we do things because we want to benefit from them. And I know from a saying that you did it and you got her done and and uh that's one thing but i mean i mean was this was there any incentive to get this done i mean was there like a a goal and thinking that we're going to make anything off of this or was it just no. something just I mean, to do or you know i mean at the end of the day like you said earlier it's all covers so there isn't much you can make off doing something right. that's based on licensing um 
I th- I You've got a huge amount of musicians now at your plethora that you can use in the future if you ever need. I'm sure you made tons of connections off of that, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think really it was just more about just doing something that, obviously initially it was like something to like help all these musicians and so give them something to enjoy because um, they were really finding it like it was such, you know, the nature of musicians, you know, the yeah. a special kind of creature where I think engineers and producers not as much because they're kind of more altruistic and kind of have ways of working whereas musicians are a lot more likely to kind of you know just like shrink into a hole if things aren't <laughs> yeah. working um so the initial thing was purely just that but at the same time i don't like to do anything half-baked and i don't right. do anything but like oh you know i've done this now that, that's fine i need to make sure it's as good and then you know i want it to something to be proud of so um that's great man if people say they like it, then it's great, you know, and I can use it say, hey, this is something that I did way back. That's cool. But that that's kind of enough for this, you know. Well, you know. It's gaining uh, steam. You're at 290,000 views so he's far. He's pushing 300. Yeah. yeah. And, and That's great, man. I, I, that's why I was wondering how you got the flow because I it, – I thought somebody who wrote this had to flow it together. I mean, you—that's why you did. Well, you did it, and and I mean, it, yeah. and you should applaud yourself for that. But also, you know, and I'm, I saw this some, whether you said it or on your website, a comment about the difference between an engineer and a producer. Yeah, yeah. Because as a producer, Caleb, KT, and I are both producers. We understand when you're working musicians, it's mm. because we is one, uh, and and. That was one of the, when I went in the studio in 94, my producer was, he just knew how to work with me because it yeah. wasn't like, dude, that really sucked. Do it again. He would just, <laughs> he would be very, very positive about it. I think you can do that a little bit better. And yeah. you, you're working well, all these people. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's not what you do. <laughs> but I no, think I you work with all, producers that, you know, just really good friends with, and they're just like, come on, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I mean, there's the other thing. You're working with all these different people with their different personalities that it's your project, it's your baby. And so uh, that's another part of it, that working with musicians, of course, that's what you do for a living, but still, you yeah, know, yeah. I mean, the engineer is the guy that sits, most people think an engineer. And I grew up wa- reading the liner notes on albums. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, my goal when I, in 1990, I was... I got married and I went to London and of course my wife says, where you want to go? I got to go to Abbey (laughs) Abbey Road. So the funny thing about it, I'm standing outside Abbey Road and she goes, why aren't you going in? And I said, I'm not worthy. (laughs) And I said, said, I'm just not worthy. And she goes, oh, for God's sakes, go in. So I go in It's you know, and I go in there looking at me, I'm going, hey, do you have a rate sheet? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, what else am yeah, I going right. to say to? Him? I'm not going to bring a band over from from the you know the states to play, and and so I looked at all that Jeff Emery, all these people that I've seen over the years, you know, Glenn John, all these people that you've heard of for years, hmm. and I. But my point being is, and and Katie and I have talked about it too. Being an, a, 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 an engineer, a producer. We all record differently. We may record the same music, but we hear it differently. So yeah. there is no right way or wrong way. There is better ways of doing it, but at the mm-hmm. end of the day, there is no right way or wrong way. It's the way I like it or the way you like it. And you hope, and, and, and one of the things I did was when I got the DAW and started doing it at home, I started listening to the old records and I went, man, these things weren't very good recorded, but we thought they were great back then. <laughs> And, and, and now, of course, like you said, and I know that you, you use pro tools, if I'm correct, I think that's what you're using. Um, Mm -hmm. now I just sit back and go, man, I remember the days you had to go back. And when I originally recorded the big tape, the 30 IPS threw the old B on it. And I never touched the original recording because my engineer would do that. Cause like, man, I've touched something. I'm going to screw something up. Mm -hmm. Well, now with the digital, it's like, oh, I messed it up go back and it's changed a lot yeah yeah, yeah. But, but and i know there's getting a discussion analog versus digital and stuff but at the end of the day you still yeah. have to know what you're doing and yeah. when i i didn't teach kids very long because people i don't have the patience <clears throat> to teach people how to play guitar but they'd see me and they and i have i'm a les paul guy so they'd go i want to learn how to play so i can play that and i'd say just just because i have an expensive guitar doesn't mean you're going to be any good it takes mm-hmm. practice. 
So I, I think that's the other part of your personality, having to work with all these musicians. And even though you were trying to do it so they'd have something to do, it still turned out a tremendous product. And have, have you had any response from outside people saying, besides us, obviously, we like the project. Uh, I heard you. Can you do something for us? I mean, has any of that come about yet? Um, sort of. Um, there's been people kind of, you know, just saying, oh, you know, great job. It'd be cool if we could do something, but nothing like, you know, concrete that will go anywhere just yet. Um, which I'm kind of not expecting it to because, you know, this kind of thing isn't the kind of thing where people look at it and think, oh, I want that guy to make me one or something, you know. It's yeah, just right, something no. that people, it's, it's a very YouTube style thing where people just watch it yeah. and then like, oh yeah, cool, I watched the thing, now I'm going to go watch the next thing. Um, yeah. yep. So I'm not really expecting much of that. But I know that some of the musicians have had people contact them, asking them to work on projects for them, which yeah, I yeah. think is great, you know, that's it's yeah. awesome. So yeah. I'm curious, man, just because of the Pro Tools thing. <clears throat> I know there's so many, so many of them out there right now. Are our studio still the Pro Tools staple type? Is that like you know, the the <laughs> thing, or is that just because when you was that was that the software? Of course, that's the software that the LA Studio is going to use. Yeah, yeah. Every studio you go to, but is that the reason why you you went with Pro Tools and stuck with Pro Tools because that's what you you learned and it was a staple? Um, so I, I'm, I'm a logic I'm, guy right now, but that's just because. I can't yeah. afford to buy Pro Tools. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, there's a few sides to it. There's the kind of the kind of snobby kind of, oh, if you're not using Pro Tools, you're not a real studio yeah. kind of thing, which right, I was right, aware right. of. Um, so also, I didn't want to, you know, turn away that kind of thing. But I, I don't know. I think for a lot of stuff, like any door is just, you know, it's a, it's a computer, right? It's always going to do the yeah. same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it gets to a certain point where when you're trying to do certain things that the other ones just won't cut it, whether it's doing right. films or post-production yeah. or if you're just trying to, you know, run 32 microphones in at the same time and record it all like live and then, you know, edit it all seamlessly. It's, sure. sure. It's still kind of the, like the one that's going to do it properly. Um, I feel like, um, it's always about the guy, isn't it? So I'm sure, sure a guy who's an expert in logic could probably compete exactly the same as a guy who's an expert in Pro Tools. Um, but I feel like because Pro Tools is kind of built around the engineer rather than built around trying to show off what we can do for you, it kind right. of feels a lot more organic. Like you run Pro Tools like you'd run a mixing desk, you know? Um, yep. If you want to do something, you have to know how it works to make it happen. Um, and as long as you know all the shortcuts and stuff, it's just as quick as logic's one button that does it all in five seconds for you right. um, yeah yeah no, logic, you didn't know you wanted to do that logic is like hey if you do this we'll do this for you yeah. and it's like, we'll okay <laughs> yeah so i think i think we it's more it mentality it. you know um yeah. it's the same argu argument with digital versus analog um you know you i don't think you can really compare the two because if you've got a guy who's great at digital and a guy who's great at analog they're going to make great stuff but if you get a guy who's taking all the shortcuts to digital and then you throw him on analog, he's going to make a terrible piece of music mm -hmm. and vice versa. Um, so I think it's less about sense. the equipment and what it is, more about like mentality and how you use it. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, yeah, I, was sure. talking to, I was talking to KT about it since he's a trained engineer. And I said, I noticed that there's a lot of different mics used. And yeah, yeah. he said, well, that's difficult. <laughs> well, but I mean, so did you... Did you There's try different, different mics on different people just to see if you get a different sound, or did you kind of have up your mind, oh, I'm going to do this? Yeah, yeah, it's just my um, just my engineer head, really, um, just thinking, like, what's going to get the best tone out of these guys or what's going to suit the song. Um, yeah. There, there were a few of the guys I'd worked with a few times before and knew what complemented their voice. Um, like the guys who did the, um, the Chris Cornell track, um, there's this one mic that I have, which I kind of wish I didn't have anymore because I bought it ages ago. And it's the reissue of the AKG C12, which mm. is made to look really pretty, but it's really just a really yeah. expensive microphone that's not anything like the microphone it's pretending to be. Like it's good, <laughs> but it's not like, it's not what it says it is. Um, but the only time I always go to it without fail is on this guy's voice, because it just adds this really nice fizzy kind of sizzly mm. thing on his voice, which is really nice. Yeah. Um, whereas on other people, it can just sound terrible. Um, so with people like that, I knew that certain mics were just complementing them. With others, it was just a bit of trial and error. Um, sure. You know, like uh, 
there's a, the another guy who did um the the Louis Armstrong song. Oh yeah. Uh, and he's got this really cool kind of Otis Redding style voice. Um, yeah. So using like the U forty seven on him was just a no brainer because it just brings out all that kind of presence and why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Well, and I think that's where the difference in we're talking about people. KT and I live very close together, so when I go over to record or go do something, I wrote a song. We're just getting ready to put it out. He's, I just watch him work and it's just like completely different than me because he's doing, yeah. he's trained and he just, you know, doing stuff and I can do this and I'm going like, okay, that'll be like three days for me to figure out how to do it. And, and so it's just like you, you're trained to do that and you hear things. And, and I, yeah. that, that is something I think that you can learn. It's kind of like being a musician. You can learn to mm -hmm. play, but you may not learn. You can't really play. It's like playing drums. It's like, oh, I can play the drums, but I don't play drums. So yeah, I think yeah. the same way with being an engineer that you got to have it. And then but having that producer hat on it, because then the fact that you scored it out completely, you already knew in your head, you probably heard some of the stuff in your head. I mean, it's just, yeah. I mean, yeah, I can't, that's, I mean, I yeah. hear voices, but not that kind I of ADD. I can't hear I hear voices that. like that. <laughs> I mean, I'm the first guy to always advocate, like, not wearing all the hats at the same time, though. That's the thing. Yeah. You know, whenever people hire me as an engineer or whatever, I'm just like, okay, who's the producer then? You know, I'm, right. a lot of bands will come in and they'll just be like, oh, you're the producer, right? I'm like, oh, no, I'm an engineer. Like, you know, what do you want me to, to do? I'm not going to tell you how to be you. Um, but just purely because of like the situation with um, the pandemic and stuff. I was like, well, I can't get other people in here to do all these roles. So I had to kind of, you know, I'd have loved it if someone could be there in engineering one, just there listening to the music and say, okay, this needs to do that and that. Yeah, that's it just wasn't really, so it was just kind of like each one of these band members or orchestra members coming in one at a time and me just sat there like, right, how do I make this work? And yeah. um, I mean, Pro Tools was a mess, like, with that. I was trying to do it all in one session, and it ended up having to be split into five sessions because it was just too huge. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, so I ended up having to, you know, um, arrange it and then record it and edit it and mix it and produce it, and I had to do the video myself, too. I was um, going to say, did you do the video, too? You were shooting? Yeah, and, and I'm, not, I don't, I'm not a video guy. I'm just a guy with a camera. Um, so, so did you run and t start it and then go, I'll record <laughs> at the same time? Is that what you did? Oh yeah, I was like doing a workout at the same time. So, oh, wow. Yeah, we did it to make sure it was easy and there was no pressure. We recorded it all first, got the takes out. Like everyone was yeah. super nervous, and then once we yeah. got the take, we're like, okay, let's run it by one more time with the camera and mime it, because then there was yeah. just no pressure. So yeah. I think in the video there's a bit of lip sync, but it just mm. it just it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Wow. It still works. And I and I I remember the first time I went in the studio, and I, and the producer goes, "You need to kind of relax." <laughs> Because, you know, if you haven't never been, and you ran into this because you had some people that had never been in a studio. You stick those real expensive microphones in front of you and you think you're an okay yeah. singer. Then you hear yourself and you're like, oh, I'm not that good. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then I remember the first when I did my first album, I, I was doing an acoustic song. It was an instrumental. And he goes, why are you playing it like three times faster than you normally do? And I went, you know, and it just took me a long time to get into that groove. Mm -hmm. It's relaxing and and it's kind of like when we perform with kt and i perform you know i always wanted to be up for the gig and but not you want to be good enough that you just not it doesn't kill your you're in a situation where you, the pressure is like oh my god i can't stand you know and that's the same way in going to studio and watching very famous engineers and all that talk about things on youtube and all the famous iconic songs. Right now, we got the Beatles thing coming out with the Let It Be. Yeah, yeah. And I look at the equipment, and that's it's just amazing to me. I mean, what the difference in what they recorded on that what we have now. Now, even before mm -hmm. even before the digital age, when we had twenty four track or thirty six track, you know, analog, and say how how did they get that sound? It sounds. I mean, it was. The, back to who was their engineer and producer? Hello, that's what made the difference. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, now that I know even more about the project, that just amazes me that it's it came off as well as it did. Not that, not to, I, because I wondered who's doing the recording, who's doing the, you know. So then, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. then you finish the, the 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 sound, and then you took the digital. I mean, you took the camera, and then you had to put it together. 
Yeah. And not, yeah. Not, only, not only you had to piece the parts together, then you had to you had to edit the film that you made. Yeah, my least favorite part. It was yeah, it was tedious. It is very tedious. Yeah. And, and good that, stuff, man. It's yeah. awesome. So, yeah. um, any KT? What else? You got any special questions for him? Since you want to talk, well, I mean, we're, we're or pretty much almost coming to that point. I guess the one thing that I would just out of this whole thing before we go, just because I'm just kind of interested on on where you're at with it now. You know, with technology and everything advancing the way that it is, yeah. And a bulldozer about to destroy your studio. <laughs> um, have you looked into any of the um, mobile style recordings as far as being able to have artists record from you know? their own place or or stuff like um, that you... not like i think not as a kind of a career step forward um oh well, yeah like no, so i'm kind of like a bit old school in that i feel like i'm 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 fine with like all the super portable digital cheap affordable stuff but i kind of feel that you know everyone like a 12 year old can go out and buy an interface and use garage band sure. or whatever yeah um and create a record and whether or not i'm there that's going to happen regardless you know right. um and there isn't much i'm going to do that's make an impact on on whether that sounds any better or worse because mm. you're listening to music today especially all the um the lockdown albums that are coming out which people are like yeah. oh this is great we did this remotely and it's like people have been recording remotely forever man like, for sure yeah anything but what is happening is the quality of that stuff is just going real really down um yeah you know it's just, and it's not even though it's kind of fine, it doesn't really matter because as long as people like the it music, it happens anyway, right? right? You put it on um, your phone. <laughs> exactly. So I feel like for me to try and like get in on that is just not going to be doing myself true. And I just yeah. kind of want to make sure, sure. I'm, I'm doing what I think makes better music, which is putting effort into every aspect of it, whether it's the recording or the venue, the space, yeah. um, or the producing or whatever, you know, we're getting the right mics. You know, if I wanted to, if I wanted to, I could have recorded this whole um, 23 minute medley and let everyone use their microphone at home because they probably all had one. They could have sent it to me. Um, I could have just glued it together. I could have thrown it out there and go, like, hey, look, another lockdown yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I was like, there's only one person because he moved to um, like Rotterdam, I think, who had his vocal recorded at home where the band still came into my studios. But okay. every single person, they're just like, oh, okay, can I, when shall I send it to you? I was like, no, like, if you want to do this, you're going to come into the you're studio come in. and we're going to do this like a proper record because A, that means you're getting out of the house and you'll, it'll be good for you. And like B, why do this if it's not going to be as good as it could be? Um, and I'm not saying it's perfect, but I feel like putting that effort in and making sure that I was using the space properly, using the microphones properly, using Pro Tools properly. Sure. Um, and then not cutting my own corners and thinking, oh, I can just like, I can just, you know, I can tune this or I can edit this and fix it. Like, oh no, let's like make this sound good is why it's come out like it has. That's awesome. Um, okay. So it's, sure. Like I say, it's kind of like a little bit of a swan song for this, the building I was at. And I, I wouldn't want the next thing I do to be like, okay, now it's like, now I can yeah. start being lazy and cutting corners. I want to, still work in the way that I work, you know? Good so stuff, what's man. What's next for you, though? I mean, you're sitting at home. I assume all your equipment's in storage someplace. And Yeah, most of it. Um, I mean, I've got a, a few grand worth of Pro Tools on my desk, um, so I'm keeping that out of storage. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, there's, um, there's a few bands and projects that I'm still working on, um, which are just bands that I produce. Um, so I'm working with those guys, and it's just a case of, you know, just going with the wind really and seeing where it takes me. Good stuff, well, man. Um, before well, we I, wish you all the best for yeah, sure. Yeah, we wish you all the best. Well, first, I wanted to say thank you very much for coming on our, our little show here. Um, no, thanks for coming to chat with me. Well, I, yeah. I just, we're going to continue to grow our channel. I'm definitely going to keep in touch. Yeah. So the other question I had, is it any, is there any conceivable way that I could, that you have the list of all these people that I could reach out to any of them? I mean, yeah, um, well, the list of them. on the channel has everyone's artist name, what they go by music-wise. Yep. Okay. Um, yep, there's only two or three that just aren't really social media people, um, but they're all they're all on there. 
So they're um, all probably on Instagram or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So the the artist name is on there. Um, if you just search that on Instagram or Facebook, okay, um, you should be able to find pretty much all of them. If not, you know, just drop me a line and I'll, I'll try and hook you up. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's we awesome. just think it's just one of those things, and and we're trying to expand um, our repertoire. We started out just doing podcasts. Mm -hmm. And KT says, and they were kind of, they were fun. And I, we wrote some funny stuff and all that. But then we said, why are we talking about music? Because that's really what we know. And so we started interviewing local musicians and people like that. And then I just started finding people. So I had a gal from the London send me an Instagram. She found me and I saw, well, she's a recording studio, you know, so I went to her and she goes, yeah, I'll be on the show. And, you know, yeah. you were kind enough to go on. So we want to, we really want to define unique people like yourself that can, talk about their lives and talk about projects they're involved in and to get them more exposure. That's really what it's about mm -hmm. because it's all about the people we interview and it's not about us because we, we love talking to people. We want to know more about it, and especially if it's in what we do and we love. So, um, once again, thank you. Well, too, also, if you don't mind real quick, just let everybody know how to, um, how to look you up, man. If, if people want to look you up or, or go to your channel, I mean, I, I know we'll probably put some markers and stuff on the, yeah, we're going on the to. video of clickbait style stuff to get them to go yeah, to yeah. your page. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, in terms of um, the work I do now, it's all under Alchemistic Records. So if you okay. find that on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, um, then that's the way to find me. Yeah. We'll okay. put a link on the, on the, the video too that people can hook you up but yeah man thanks yeah. a lot for coming on man it's awesome yeah. i can and sit here probably with you you and i could probably <laughs> sit here and talk all day long about studio stuff in la and all yeah that people don't talk to me about like the nerdy stuff too often so when they do it yeah, just, yeah, just goes yeah. on and on and on well once again dave thank you very yeah, much thanks a lot man on. no thanks appreciate guys. appreciate it, it.